Heisenberg writes the following. Yeah. The first swallow from the cup of the natural sciences makes atheists. But at the bottom of the cup, God is waiting. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Shalom. This is the Chemia Gordon. I am here in Jerusalem for the latest episode of Hebrew Voices with Dr. Gerald Schroeder. He has lived in Israel since 1971, immigrated, made Aliyah from the United States. He has a a PhD, a doctorate that he got in 1965, a dual topic of nuclear physics and earth and planetary science. He is a prominent author and teacher today on the topic of God and science. And in fact, one of his books here that I'm looking at right now, it's called The Science of God. He has another one called The Hidden Face of God. And this is the one I, I hope we can spend the most time about. It's called God According to God. That's really exciting. His first book, though, was called Genesis and the Big Bang, and it was really revolutionary at the time. It was the first book on science in the Bible ever published by a major, really secular publishing house back in, in what was it, 1990 or something, something like about, that. Yeah, and along that time, yeah. Wow. So that, that's actually really significant, because there, there were books like that, but they were always published by religious publishing houses. And this was published by a secular publishing house, this main, you know, regular publishing house, and it's still in print today, you told me. Yeah. Which is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm an author as well, and I, and I know that for most publishing setups, you know, the book is sold for 18 months, and then it becomes what they call a backlister, and it's, you know, in the discount pile. And then, then you're not, not even your book is still being sold and still being read by people, more importantly. After uh, 25 years. Yeah, wow, amazing. That's, that's amazing. When I brought it to the publisher, yeah. they said the reason they're, they're, they're buying it, because it's a big deal yeah. at that time, it was a gamble. Yeah. He said, if you'd come to me as Rabbi Schroeder, we wouldn't have looked at the book. Okay, so but why did you do it? If you come to me as Professor Dr. Gerald Schroeder from MIT, oh, okay. we're going to look at the book. So you've got a PhD, you got your PhD from MIT? Bachelor's, Master's, and PhD. Wow, and then, uh, then when you moved to Israel, you worked at some really prestigious institutions. You worked at the Weizmann Institute, which has produced quite a number of Nobel Prize winners. It's a very prestigious institute. Mm-hmm. Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which I maintain is the best university in the world, because that's my alma mater. And, um, but definitely in science and uh, biblical studies, of course, what I learned, I studied there, is it's the best in the world. And today you teach at Eshet Torah, the College of Jewish Studies in the Old City of Jerusalem. Yeah, and and uh, what do you teach there? Well, I teach, uh, I teach there. I also give lectures in different mm-hmm. places around the world. Yeah. I teach there this integration. Hebrew word is shiluv. The yeah. shiluv, the integration, the flowing together of science and Bible. And Hebrew it works nicely. Torah v'teva. Ah, Torah being the word, word for the Bible v'teva. and teva being the word for nature. And so, people know the word teva because there's a major pharmaceutical company they called in English teva, but it's really teva, it's, yeah, which, exactly. which ironically means nature, even though they make pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so Torah and teva means Torah, the instruction, what some people translate as law, and nature. Okay. Yeah, that the two come together. That, oh, nice. That, that, that it's not teva. a conflict, that it's not... It's not what does is, what is the Bible say versus what the science says. It's what they both say. They're, they're two sources of information. Yeah. They're complementary with an E. They complete one another. Mm-hmm. And there actually is, yeah. Nehemiah, there's actually interesting, there's a tradition yeah. that when the Bible was given to Moses on Sinai, yeah. he only got part of it. Okay. Part came down as somehow, we have no idea how it was written, but how it got imprinted mm-hmm. in his brain somehow. Yeah. But the other part, was hidden in nature. We're not talking about the oral law. We're not talking about the, the was part of the Torah was hidden in nature. Yeah, and wow. that only, and that only huh. when we understand the part of the, that the part of God that's expressed in nature, in the mm-hmm. deepest sense in nature, can we understand the entire Bible. Wow. Maimonides says it's straight out. Really, I, I've actually never heard that. That's very interesting. Yeah. So I want to start with the video you have. It's a five minute video, and we're going to share a link to it. We're going to post it on the website, nehemiahswall.com. And uh, it's a video called, it's called like Proof of God in Five Minutes or something like that. And it's had like 3 million views. And I was looking at the video. It's shared on all kinds of Christian websites and Jewish websites and all kinds of websites that aren't Orthodox Jewish people from the old city. So yeah, what is I what know. is the proof of God in five minutes? So yeah. what is this proof of God, uh, you know, as we say in Hebrew, standing on one leg? Yes, anyway. First of all, that's three million, about a million are Jewish sites, and two wow. million and two million are mm-hmm. Christian sites. Wow. It's really interesting, this interest, because people are, you know, one of the songs, the people are thirsty, I think, really mm-hmm. thirsty. But the proof of the God, proof of God in five minutes, is I take data totally, only, and completely data from the NASA website, NASA mm-hmm. National Space Authority. Yeah. And they have a diagram of the flow of time of the universe from its creation mm-hmm. through time. But I only deal with, because we're talking about proof of God, the very creation of the universe. Okay. And I say in the, in the video that the whole question of the science and Bible matches a non-starter because right in that diagram from NASA, 
It was proof of God. And what it shows is wow. that a force of nature creates the universe from absolute nothing. Now, what's interesting, if you take that in general terms, first of all, if a force of nature creates the universe from absolute nothing, that means this force, now with the capital F, has to predate the universe because it's mm. creating the universe from nothing. So you've got a force that creates the universe from nothing. The force isn't physical and the forces of nature. Gravity may pull one rock towards another or keep mm -hmm. us on the seat, but gravity itself is not physical. So you have a force that predates the universe, which means it predates how we understand time, which means it's outside of time mm -hmm. and it's not physical. Mm -hmm. And it creates the universe from absolute nothing. I'll just say that in one sentence. A force that is not physical, that's outside of time, creates the universe from absolute nothing. If you haven't noticed it, that's the Bible's definition of God. So basically on the NASA official diagram of how they understand the universe, they don't say God, of course, but but God forbid. <laughs> but but what they describe is what we call God in, in the Jewish tradition and probably also in the Christian tradition. I, I've discussed this with so many wow. you know, multi how you say multi religious groups that uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's wow. interesting. But I think most interesting is that I discuss this with secular scientists. I would put yeah. that in quote with secular scientists. They'll say, okay, so it matches it. So if mm. you want to call that God, call it God. And then they have another half of the sentence. But? <laughs> but it wouldn't be a God that would be interested in how the universe works after the creation. Mm. It would be a God, a deist God, creates the universe and then goes off and has lunch and watches the universe roll itself out. Mm -hmm. So some people say, well, that's, too, that's not enough. Realize what it's saying. That cup is half full for the first time. The big time secular, the names you know, the big time secular scientists mm -hmm. are willing to say the creation of the universe matches in general terms, mm -hmm. the biblical creation of the universe. Now, the only question is the second half of the cup, but the cup is now half full. It's not half empty, it's half full. And so the second half of the cup is what is the nature of that God? But basically, there's Absolutely. some kind of creative entity, force. force, a creative force. And it's interesting <laughs> the way you're describing it, because from what I, you know, my, in my Jewish uh, education, you know, we, we heard about how the philosophers, like in the story of the Kuzari, that the philosopher came before the king of the Khazars, and he said that, you know, yeah, there's a god, but he, he, he doesn't care. He's, he's done. He retired. And, and the ancient Canaanites had a similar doctrine as well. I don't know if you know anything about that, or we don't have time to go into that. But basically, they had this doctrine that there was a creative being that created the universe, and then he went and retired on the mountain of the north, and he left it to his son to rule the world, to Baal. And what the Torah comes along and says is, no, the creator of the universe cares about you individually. You, you know, you, the slave woman, who's hiding out in the desert, you know, who's praying to God, you know, Yishmael, God hears. Yeah. So what you're saying is they're willing to stipulate to part of it, but not to the other part of what the actual nature of God. And that we learn about from scripture, right? I mean, yeah. is, that, you, is that what you would say? Well, I would say, look around the world and see if it seems it's, it's just random. Okay. Or it looks like it's a flow. And Moses actually, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, mm -hmm. says essentially, if you want to figure out if there's a God in this world or not, mm -hmm. he says, Zechor yemot olam, Remember the days of old, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the creation, the six days of Genesis. Remember mm -hmm. the days of old, or binochinok door for door, yeah. or look at the flow of social history. So mm -hmm. Moses gives two keys about God active mm -hmm. in the world. Not the creation now, we got the creation, that's yeah. satisfied. Remember the six days, there's how that Genesis chapter one describes the flow of the universe. Does that make sense? Or if you don't know enough science, then look at the Bino Chino door for door. Then look at the flow of social history. Does it look like to you that the flow of social history makes sense? Look, as a Jew, so I'll use my, my own example. I can't Please. Know, I, the yeah. position that this minuscule people, you know, when you look at the, the population, <laughs> China does a, a population study. Who knows? Two tenths in billion plus or minus 300 million. I mean, <laughs> in that plus or minus, you got 10 times the amount. <laughs> then you got Jews. In the it's actually the population of the U.S., their margin of error. <laughs> exactly, their margin of error. Wow. But so I think as a Jew, that's mm -hmm. what, what I think God, remember when chosen or holy means, it doesn't mean special, mm -hmm. it means visible. Mm -hmm. And the Jews, I think, are a mm -hmm. marker in wow. the world that God is act all God cares about all nations. It make, it's very clear right from the beginning. There's no question. We see that constantly. This idea that persons yeah. have that oh the, the Bible really just says you know the, the Jews think only the Jews that's completely not biblical. I give you two examples. We come out of Egypt in the Exodus. 
And then being the nudniks sometimes that we are, God That's forbid. That's a nag in yeah, English. <laughs> yeah, we built a golden calf for 40 yeah. days, really just 40 days after all the miracles, we're building golden calves already. Yeah. Okay, God hits the roof and says to Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. But God says something interesting, he says to Moses, Hanichali, leave me alone so I can wipe them out. Now God has mm-hmm. to ask Moses to leave them alone. You're like, it does, obviously not. Uh-huh. But then Moses, and pardon me, for, I hope this doesn't sound like heresy. Moses reads to God the facts of life. <laughs> Moses says the following to God, you know, God, you are certainly powerful enough to wipe them out. But mm-hmm. if you wipe them out, the Egyptians will say that you took them out in the desert just to kill them. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a rather strange argument. Who cares about the Egyptians? You know who cares mm-hmm. about the Egyptians? God. Mm-hmm. God backs down. You take mm-hmm. the text as it's written. That's what God, according to God, has to say. God oh, wow. actually backs down and says, you're right. I'll, I'm going to destroy the people that pray to the calf. The others don't. The exact same thing, Nehemiah, happens mm-hmm. a late, a several months later, and then it leads to the 40 years in the desert. But it's a 40 yeah. The Israelites are about to go into the land. The 12 spies come back, mm-hmm. and 10 of them say it's a great land, but they're all giants. Let's go back to Egypt. So the, God says to Moses, this time, I'm going to wipe out the entire congregation. And I'm going to build you another congregation that's better. They won't Made be up from Mos- Moshe, from yeah, Moses. From right. Moses. And Moses, yeah. again, says the facts of life. God, you have the power to do that, but right. it's not in your best interest. Because if you wipe mm. us out now, the nations of the world, get this, Nehemiah, mm-hmm. the nations of the world will say you wiped them out because you weren't strong enough to bring them into mm. Canaan to defeat the Canaanites. Yeah. And God says, you know, you're right. And, and is all this to say that that God's interaction in history with the people of Israel is for the world to see? I mean, that's the whole purpose of it, in, in a, or a major purpose of it. Well, for the world to see, because God is interested in the world knowing there's a God. Mm. Why would God care about the nation saying that God, you know, that, that mm. well, God takes the argument of Moses, the nations will say you're a wimp, yeah. and God doesn't want to be seen as a wimp. Mm-hmm. So God says, okay, those that said to go back to Egypt, mm-hmm. they're going to be gone, but everyone else is going to come in. So consistently, the argument, the trump card, as it were, that Moses pulls out of the deck each time to save the people is the nations of the world will say, who cares about the nations of the world? God cares a lot. The Jews Mm. may be markers. I think, I think, I hope I'm not What do you mean by markers? That's a scientific term. uh, 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 What's that in plain English? uh, We stand out. We stand out. Not always. I I hate to say it. I don't want to, maybe I shouldn't even say it. I won't. But there, there are also some pretty... There's some phenomenally wonderful people that happen to be Jewish, like Einstein and yeah. you know, Michael and Morley and Salk and Sabin and Paul and all those, those things and Nobel mm-hmm. Prize winners. Yeah. And there are also some cruddy ones also. Uh-huh. But they all we stand won't name out. Those. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to name them. I could name them, but I don't want to we name them. We won't do that. Go on. Yeah. Well, all right. You no, know, so I'm just saying, we are, I think, because yeah. that's the statement. Remember that in Deuteronomy yeah. chapter 30, verse 7, remember yeah. the days of old? Okay. Social history is one of the markers. You don't have to need no science to see the flow. And by system. social history, in this case, you mean the history of the Jewish people and God's interaction with the people of Israel in history. Is that, is that what that, you're saying? That would be, yes. For a Christian, they might see uh, well, a for difference. anybody who's listening. Yeah. In other words, you know, we're, we're two Jews sitting here. So from our perspective, and I, and I would say this, I don't know if you're saying this. I, when I, you know, people ask, why do you believe in God? And one of the reasons for me is I look at the history of my people and I read about it in Deuteronomy and the blessing and the curse. How, you know, we could, we, you know, and in the prophets, how we can be a light to the nations or we can be a, you know, it says a mashalu shnina, a proverb and a byword. If we're bad, then we're going to be punished yeah. and the whole world will look at us yeah. and it'll be an example of God's, you know, judgment. And so both have actually been seen in history, even in modern history. Yeah. So for me, I think that's what you're saying, or at least that's what I take from it. This, um, you know, social history, what you're calling social history is, as opposed to scientific history, I guess, or natural history, is, you know, the history of the people of Israel is, you know, proof of God's existence in the world, according to Moses, even, you're saying in Deuteronomy 32. Is, yeah, it, is that yeah, yeah. fair to say? Yeah. And you talk about this more in the book, God According to God. We'll have a link for this on the website, nehemiaswall.com. And uh, the subtitle is, A Scientist Discovers We've Been Wrong About God <laughs> yeah. All Along. So we changed it to another and, and you changed the subtitle. You added a second subtitle, <laughs> yeah. What the Bible Really Tells Us About God. <laughs> We've been wrong about God all along. That's, that's controversial, but it's probably yeah. Yeah. true. And you actually made a statement to me about that book, which I got a quote. You said, I don't want to learn what my rabbis or theologians say about God. And I hope everybody listening to that agrees, at least about the theologian part. I want to know what the Bible says about God. And, and I have this Christian friend who hears something like this, and he'll always say, Amen! amen. <laughs> so I'm going to say, Amen. <laughs> yeah, um, amen, va- Amen. I see on your wall here, it says, Toll an Asian tsunami continues to, and I assume it's a swell there. But you were, and you, go, and you brought the tsunami, 
in 2004 is an example of how when you look at what the Bible really says about God, it matches what we see in the world, such as accidents and tsunamis. So tell us about that. What is that? Well, it means that that God can, well, first of all, we see this famous crucial statement in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. uh, When Moses asks for God's name, Mm -hmm. God says, I will be that which I will be. Not I am that I am. Compare the sentences in the Bible. Mm. And in the English Bibles, it usually says, I am that which I am. And in the Hebrew, it says, and you were telling me about an experience you had with, what was it, a, at a papal, papal conference. A papal conference. And tell us about that. That's amazing. I'll make it clear the Pope was not present. Okay. It goes back about <laughs> six, seven years. But, but he sponsored it or something. But a, you know, okay. uh, it was in Rome and, and a scholar from an English speaking country, I, I don't like to even degrade the country, but it's a, it's a, okay, it wasn't the United States. Okay. Okay. Go on. <laughs> uh, and he's from the major universities, and he says the key statement, he's the representative of this healing, the key statement about God in the entire Bible is Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. My mind is going grinding, grinding. I, I don't remember what it was. And then he says, I am that I am. I almost fell off my chair when he said that, because wow. in any event, the irony of this is the Hebrew, as Nehemiah just said, yeah, asher, yeah, yeah. The question is, is it I am that I am or I will be that which I will be? Because the Bible says I will be that which I will be. Mm -hmm. Now, the I am that I am comes from the Septuagint 2,200 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the Septuagint comes from the Hebrew into the Greek. Then the Greek went into the Latin, Augustine. And then the Latin went into the English, uh, 1611, uh, King James. So you got like telephone here, you know, things. (laughs) So this guy speaking in English, he's basing it on the Septuagint translated from Hebrew into Greek. And then Jerome translating the uh, the Septuagint from Greek into into Latin, the the Vulgate, and then now the Vulgate is translated into English. And so he ends up with "I am that which I am" instead of "Eheya Sherehiya," which is a pretty important statement. And, and you're saying it means "I will be that which I will be." And what's the irony is that's Exodus chapter three verse twelve. In Exodus chapter three, that's fourteen, and and you were saying in twelve. Oh, it I beg says, your pardon. Exodus chapter three verse fourteen. Yeah. Go back two sentences, and I just did this in class a few hours ago. Yeah. Even if you don't know Hebrew. If you get a Hebrew text and you can look at the shapes of the letters, mm-hmm. even if you don't know the letters, you'll notice that the same word, Ihia, appears in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, two sentences earlier, I will uh-huh. be with you. And Nehemiah, you're mm-hmm. pointing this, yeah. uh, this phrase. Is it's actually a theme throughout the entire Bible. Ihia imach or Ihia I will be with you. And, and what, what is it always? I will be. I will be, right. Oh, always right. the future, I will be. Ihia. And so two sentences earlier, of the I am that I am, the identical I am is translated as I will be, because that's what it means. The, mm-hmm. the text says, I will be that which I and will be. what's the difference between I am and I will be? That, that... I am is a pigeonhole God. You know, you can, it's okay. fixed. It's not, we don't like He's that a kind static of God. God. I am a, that which sta- I am. Uh, yeah, static, okay. yeah. yeah. We and, don't what's, wanna... and what's Ahia Shalahia? It's a dynamic God. Mm. God sometimes hides God's face. God can mm. pull back. What God... does it mean for those who don't know God, God hides his face? God is always present. But mm-hmm. God's manifestation sometimes is hidden. And so we can say, well, how could God let that happen? Well, God lets... Where, ser- so when somebody says, where was God in the tsunami? The answer is God hid his face. What, what's the answer? Uh, that, na- that accidents happen in this world and God lets them happen. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes steps in one way or the other. I, it was, I think it was, um, it was one, of, one of these major talk, you know, pro- like Dennis, you know, Dennis Prager, these, uh, some of the talk programs. And mm-hmm. what, what we concluded was that although God can cause floods, not all floods are caused by God. Okay. Nature is also active in the world. Even the ancient commentaries, like 1800 years ago, the Talmud, mm-hmm. this commentary in the Bible, talks about accidents happening. And God just doesn't always micromanage. I know the universe, I know there are persons that hold by that, but that's not the biblical God. I'm sorry, you can see it very clearly. Ten generations from Adam to Noah. Mm-hmm. People are living to 900 years. Please, anyone listening, don't get hung up. Could it be 900? Just let it all be a metaphor of you want, but it's in there to teach. People are living to 900 years, at which point in chapter 6, verse 7 of Exodus, right before Noah, God says in Yiddish, Oy vey. <laughs> No, he doesn't say Oy vey. <laughs> he say, no, no, no. God, What does he say? He says, Nahamti. I wow. regret. Now, Nahamti has three That's English... That's the source of my name, Nahemia. Okay, uh, go on. I'm, but, regr- but, I'm regretful, but <laughs> anyway. Re- regret, repent, or reconsider. Mm-hmm. That's not the average child's picture of God, but God says, mm-hmm. Nahamti, I regret or I reconsider. I, and as I see this situation differently now, 900 year old people were a bad idea, and God brings on the flood. Again, let it be a metaphor, though we don't have time to get into it. I don't think it is. 
But I'm, so you it, believe it's literally nine hundred whatever years, nine hundred sixty nine oh, years? Yeah, of, yeah, for sure. I do it, too. Yeah, it, it makes it, otherwise the calendar wouldn't work. Okay. Archaeology, anthropology, which yeah. shows like the Bronze Age, yeah. predates the mm-hmm. flood, and you can add up those years, That's, those nine hundred years, and it matches these Tuval Cain. Okay. Invents the is uh, one of Cain's progeny. Yeah. Invents the sophisticated casting of metals. It says a point mm-hmm. blank, and it matches when you add up the years mm-hmm. by looking at parallel ages. It matches the Bronze Age that that the that the archaeology. They're not called archaeologists, but the people that dig up anthropolo- or yeah. anthropologists. Anthropology find. anthropologists uh, dig up uh, bones of pre-humans. Oh. Okay, uh, well, this is uh, way what this, they call oh, pre-humans. Okay, so archaeologists dig up human remains. So. Okay, well, forget it. It's nothing. Well, in any event. Yeah. The Bronze Age matches yeah. a Tuval Cain okay. when you look at this. Right. And that's pre-flood. Wait, so so God says, I, I nichamti, which, by the way, also can mean uh, I comfort, but not in this context. Can sit, yeah. Yeah. How do we know? Because we know nichamti yeah. is also used yeah. in the first book of Samuel. Mm-hmm. God chooses Saul to be king. Mm-hmm. Saul is the first king of Israel. Saul messes so what, is, what does it mean here? Saul messes up and God says, yeah. nichamti. I regret okay. having chosen So does it mean Saul God changed his mind? What does it mean? I think what it means is... And there's, there are a few key words in the Bible that point this. Mm-hmm. One of them is, and it, and it came to pass after these things. Okay. What things? It's telling us that God has, it's a, it's like a, it's a code word, a code phrase, mm-hmm. that God has set up several possible choices. Mm-hmm. And we humans choose which of those choices. So God sets, God says, God has plan A, 900 year old people. Wouldn't be bad to live 900 years, we'll maybe. try that. <laughs> we, try, we tried that one. Okay, that plan didn't work. So now God okay. goes to plan B, 90 or 100 year old people. Okay. The flood re- changes the change. God presses the reset button. So we go to plan B. So plan what, B so what does Nechamti mean in this context? What God, you... God, Nechamti means in this context, which I hope the speakers doesn't explode at this point. Nechamti means <laughs> I am a dynamic God. Okay. I pulled back. I let the system run. We tried to see how it would work. It didn't work. I regret having this system. I will now. Or I reconsider having this 900 year old mm-hmm. system. Then the flood comes, the conditions on the world change. There was the debate whether it's diet, whether it's climate, whatever. Conditions on the world change. And uh, gradually, look at the data. In my books, I actually plot the data. My yeah. son, actually, Josh, he plotted them Which for me. Which book is this? In? in The Science of God. The See? Science of God. And, and it, by shows, Schroeder. it shows gradually that the age spans drop, not bingo. But they, they drop... And so this is God saying, we tried plan A, and Yichamti means now we're, I'm a dynamic God, now we're going to try plan B. Yeah, and look, just the thing. Okay. This is 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. Okay. 10 generations, Noah at the lifespan, this is the lifespan. This they is on page the, 16 of the book, The in, Science of God, this in, is a graph. Yeah, in, the, okay. uh, in this print, whatever printing is, oh, 20 printing. Printings. Okay. But, but notice, gradually, the lifespans drop mm-hmm. from a very line, large number down to numbers we know today. Mm-hmm. So what? So it, it isn't like... It isn't like God changed God's mind, if you want to put it that way. Mm-hmm. It's that there are several plans set up. We choose the road, and then God says, okay, plan B wasn't, you know, that's the plan you want? Okay, we'll take that plan. You don't like that? We'll try plan A. If that yeah. doesn't work, who knows? Maybe, God forbid, there's a plan to see up the road we don't know what about yet. But uh, with this wow. agreements with the politics going on, there may be a plan C. <laughs> so, so basically, you're saying this idea of uh, Nihamti and Genesis is God is a dynamic God, as opposed to the Greek idea. And the reason that's interesting to me is that when I studied Jewish philosophy, really it was the idea of God is static. And because God's static, he can't really experience love the way we experience love. And he can't experience anger because that would mean a a second before he wasn't angry and therefore he was incomplete. And Greek philosophy really does describe God in the static way. And and I used to ascribe to that, but I've come to the conclusion that exactly what you said without reading, now I need to go read your book (laughs) because God is a dynamic God. And I think that that's the God we see in the Tanakh. And, and what we try to do, what my tradition tries to do, is to try to force God into this Greek philosophical paradigm, which comes across in the Septuagint as I am that which I am. This is what I am. There's nothing more to it. Yeah. And in the Hebrew, it's Ehiya Shereya, I will be that which I will be. And you know, my, my background is in biblical studies. And one of the things I learned is that in biblical Hebrew, you don't have past, present, and future the way you do in, in modern Hebrew. For any verb, you have what's called perfect and imperfect. And Ehiya is the imperfect, which is what they call a continual verb. And so the better translation, maybe more accurate translation of Ehiya, is I am now and I will continue to be in the future, uh-huh. which is difficult to translate into, into English yeah. and into modern Hebrew. But boy, does that express that God is a dynamic God. Yeah. So I really love that you shared that. I do want to point out, so the verse that you were talking about was Genesis 5, 6 through 8. And there it Genesis. says, 5, 6 through 8, there it says twice. Once it says, Vayinachem. 
Hashem ki asat Adam, and God and the Lord regretted that he made man, or this word nechem, which as I mentioned is related to my name, and it could mean he was comforted. But you're saying it means regret, yeah, or... Know, wait, wait, right before the flood? That's right. And then it says again in verse... Uh, I think oh, it's it's ver- oh, yeah, late, chapter, chapter, chapter 6, a, verse a 7. A couple of verse later, ver- yeah. yeah, in verse 7. Chapter 6, think, verse 7. Or sorry, 6, 5 through 8. So this is verse 7. It says, ki nechamti ki asitim, for yeah. I am, I regret, yeah. or maybe I am comforted. It's a direct statement. It's not like yeah. a parenthetical statement. It's God right. speaking. God speaking. Okay. God so when he says nechamti, what does he mean? And of course, this is a bigger topic than yeah. we can possibly get into. But people should, for their homework should go look at Numbers 23, verse 19, where it says about God that he is not a man that he should lie, and not the son of man that he should yitnacham, that he would change his mind. Yeah. And the context there is that when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And I guess here the issue is he didn't say he was going to do it. He said, I'm going to try this. And when it didn't work, he says, I'm going to try something else. Yeah. It's a totally dynamic. Yeah. But but you would agree if God makes a you know says something he says this is forever then it's really going to be forever yes and if, meaning if oh, God if God you know olam this is my right. name forever but remember the uh-huh. olam has three mm-hmm. meanings the same okay. three room room and that's I bring in a, is that is that in the book which book is that in? I tell you don't remember maybe the hidden I I, I don't I haven't read my so book. one of the, <laughs> I haven't read my, my book in a while so there's a book called the hidden face of God might be in there the science of God another book called God according to God yeah. which I've got to read yeah. and yeah. Uh, Genesis yeah. and the Big Bang no, this is Olam this is Shmi my name Le Olam mm-hmm. forever but Olam has three meanings mm-hmm. forever Le Olam in the universe Olam the, is the universe, the universe right? and hidden and hidden. This okay. is my name forever hidden in the universe. In one word, yeah. this is my name forever. It says that sentence essentially says, this is my name forever hidden and it was held within yeah. the universe. And if you want to know me, find out how the universe works. So you're actually saying it's a Torah imperative to study science in order to understand Maimani, the nature of God. My is the saying? introduction for the guy for the perplex. Yeah. Remember, people burn his books. So yeah. uh, you Let don't... me stop you there. So this was a rabbi who lived, uh, who wrote a book in 1190, and other Jews burned his book because they were books because they were so controversial. They were controversial because wow. they didn't have this pigeonhole idea of God, mm-hmm. but they misunderstood. When Maimonides said the only way you can know God is to know science, that's what he said. He makes a point blank statement. But he didn't say to be a good human being, you have to know God. To be a good human being, just to do what the Torah says. Don't do this, do that. Don't do this, do that. But you might but, not know God. But you, Yeah, but you still could be a good human being. Hmm. But if you want to know God, that was the mistake. That was yeah. your own mistake. He thought to be a good human being, you had to know about God. Because my, Moses, my, my, Moses Maimonides was a physician and a philosopher. He's a physician to the head of Egypt, to the, mm-hmm. to the king of Egypt at the time, which is a dangerous position to have because <laughs> the king gets sick. You're not, and you're his doctor. You got to kill the doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, uh, anyway, in any event, he says, yeah, that yeah. we all want to have a, understand God, but to do that, you have to know, he says, to know Mada Elokut. The science of God, which science I Science of I, divinity, really. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. if you yeah. want to know... Or knowledge Mada, of divinity. Yeah. Mada Elokut. Uh-huh. The first thing you have to do is to yeah. know Mada Teva. Those are his words. Mada wow. Teva. Okay. The science of nature. Wow, so you're saying Exodus 3.15, the very next verse, when it says, this is my name, Le'olam, it means, this is my name forever hidden in the universe. And basically, that's a, a, a Torah commandment, in a sense, or, or a, a statement, that if you really want to know God and, and the essence of his name, you have to study science. Wow. That's, look, look at the heights. That's those pretty, two. I don't know that I agree with it, but it's profound. Well, <laughs> here, here's the, on the, just right here on, the, on the, my shelf, yeah. there's a couple of cups. I actually okay. got that from some series I did with a Christian yeah. group in, in Texas. Yeah. They have a, a group called The Bottom of the Cup. It's worth looking okay. into. But they have on these, on these coffee mugs here, it's a quote from Werner Heisenberg, Nobel Laureate, 1932, Quantum okay. Physics, the first of the major... The quantum. Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? Yeah. Okay. Um, your iPhone works because of Heisenberg and okay. Schrodinger and uh, Planck and Einstein. Otherwise, you don't okay. have an iPhone. I have a Samsung Galaxy. So. Okay. okay, that's what I have also. Does that You're, work without that, it? That doesn't work without it either. <laughs> it's all, all of high tech. Okay. And Heisenberg writes the following. Yeah. The first swallow from the cup of the natural sciences makes atheists. But at the bottom of the cup, God is waiting. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Exactly. And I think on that note, we're going to end this part. And, and people will, will not forgive me if we don't come back and talk about, in the second part, we have to talk about The Six Days of Creation, which was your first book. But wow, this has been an amazing discussion. I'm really, uh, really thankful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schroeder. How can people, if they're in Jerusalem, is there any way they can come and hear you teach? Is that a possibility? The classes are wide open to for my sessions. All you'd have to do is to ask for H. 
HaTorah. It means the fire of Torah. Yeah. And Jews, Christians. So uh, com, they can go to and find out about your classes yeah, or they right. can call Ish. Yeah. And, and Jews, Christians, and Muslims can come. You don't have to be an Orthodox Jew wearing no, kippah. You can no, come. You Anybody can come. come. Dressed however you are. Okay. And uh, you ask for where the Essentials program is. The Essentials, the essentials program. Essentials program. Okay. And they'll let you come in. Wow. And while That's you're there, awesome. you want to go up and see it from the roof of the building. It's got the best food. Wow. And also, uh, come to NehemiahsWall.com and I'm going to have links to his numerous books and to his video, The Five Minute Proof of God, or whatever it's called. And uh, guys, we're going to be back and we're going to do another episode and we're going to talk about in the next episode <laughs> what I wanted to talk about from the very beginning, which is the six days of creation and how that fits with science. Until then, Shalom from Jerusalem with Hebrew Voices. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiahsWall.com.